healthy minds can tell the difference between a second and a minute and an hour and a year, whatever it is. When people are manically depressed, when they're in a really depressive state, they forget what time is and they believe that the situation is permanent. So what we would tell soldiers is suicide is a temporary fix to a temporary problem. So we tell the soldiers, like, if you're going through something and it feels like it's forever, it's not. It's just temporary. Whether it's a divorce, bankruptcy, fear of whatever it is, whatever they're going through, like, suicide isn't the right answer. All right, everyone. Welcome back to The Art of Masculinity. Today we're on with Dan Joseph. Uh, he's been genetically modifying Iraqis for his whole... Wait, no, I got that mixed up. He's uh, from Iraqi <laughs> parents. <laughs> What's going on, brother? How you doing? What's up, dude? How's it going, man? You got most of that, dude. right? Just the wrong order. <laughs> hey, man, it's all about mixing it up and seeing if we can throw people off right away, you know? <laughs> Heck yeah. I like it. I love it. Um, dude, I'm so excited to have you on. Uh, we've been planning to have this for a little Thanks. while, and we finally made it work. So this is going to be super exciting. I really love your background. I love how you're impacting the world today. We got a lot to dive into and a lot of, uh, I mean, dude, do you just like, do you ever stop writing books at this point? Cause like, I see you got so many even lined up that aren't even out yet. Right. Is <laughs> from your website. I'm actually taking a break right now. It's been about a week or two that I haven't written much. Um, just been working on some other stuff and, uh, yeah, it's my, it's i was on a on a tear for a while man just writing and yeah. it was a lot of it was thera therapeutic for myself you know so mm -hmm. it was kind of selfish it doesn't look as selfish but i think at least for me when i write it's it's just to get like bro just to get the demons out man and figure out left from right and then i mean shoot if people buy it and it helps other people that's that's awesome but predominantly it's just I got a lot of crazy going on. I got my own issues and putting it on paper. It's a, it's a practice in like meditation really. Yeah, no, I hear you, bro. I do the same thing. And, and that's kind of where I've come from with writing is I have so much content that I haven't even published, but it's like a lot of stuff. It's therapeutic for me to just get things out of my head and allow it to like Man. free reign out in the real world and then focus my mind on other things that I think can be more productive or more helpful in a lot of ways. Right. Definitely. I love that, brother. Well, hey, man, let's dive a little bit into your past. Now, I know it, but I can't do it as much justice as ever, as you can. Uh, so let's give people a little bit of background. And we're going to jump into your story here because I think it's super powerful. Um, I'll give a couple of snippets. He wasn't genetically modifying Iraqis. He's got uh, yeah. Iraqi immigrant parents from the 70s that came over and they yep. solidified their family here in America. Um, Dan has served in the U.S. military uh, as an officer, combat engineer on a sapper platoon. Uh, really cool guys. I love I love the sapper dudes. I was a regimental master breacher for um, Ranger Battalion, and that was a lot of fun. So I have a lot of respect Sick. for people who play with explosives. You played a lot with C4, uh, didn't you? Different shapes. Oh, and yeah. All that good stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. But I have a lot of respect for uh, explosives and people who love playing with them. You know, it's like the ultimate boy <laughs> dream, right? <laughs> <laughs> don't don't eat the c4 that's what they told us do not put the c4 in your mouth yeah. <laughs> it's not as sophisticated it. as it looks but yeah <laughs> but yeah man so we'll start there brother um you know with your military background and and kind of where you're coming from and take us through uh what got you into really even writing and and helping people the way that you have today uh, I mean, that starts with my soldier, Cody. He um, survived his suicide attempt my last week as platoon leader. Yeah. And that, that like, shook me um, because, you know, I was talking to the guy, looking at him as he's alive and breathing. And I'm thinking, bro, you, you almost took yourself out of the world. Like, what the heck was that about? And uh, come to find out, you know, mental health is just way more, um, I want to say, like, elaborate, way more complex than than even books can can teach, you know, when it when it comes to dealing with people. So that was some of the stuff I was processing. Um, and at the same time, my buddy Austin, uh, so Cody wrote the um, the uh, introduction of my book as a word of hope to those who are struggling, you know, from a service member who survived suicide. And uh, Austin is is a basically a brother of mine, and he uh, he lost thirteen men from his unit to suicide after Afghanistan, which is. Mm. 
Um, you know, we can put words to it, but it's not something that is even fathomable to the human brain to know 12, or I'm sorry, it was 12 when I wrote the book. After the book was published, a 13th um, guy took his life. Wow. And he knows all, you know, he was in Afghanistan with them, right? And so that kind of stuff uh, really bothered me, like at a deep, deep level, because, you know, after being around soldiers and just seeing how, I mean, you get it, like the dark humor and, and just all the stuff that they, they do and they put up with and they sustain. Um, what really bothered me was that, you know, there's not bad guys out there that are taking their lives. You know, we can't fight an enemy that's strong enough. And so they're taking themselves out. Just the irony of it is mm. mind blowing to me. And so um, they, they're the ones who inspired me to write, you know, so it's, I'm sorry to make a super heavy right off the bat, but that's honestly my why, you know, and many times I wanted to like abort the project and not finish it, not finish writing. And there's another a, a vet friend of mine, uh, Kelly, and he would just tell me, or Cage as we call him, and he would tell me like, hey man, who? what's the reason you're writing? Like, why are you writing writing this book? I'm like, for Cody and for Austin predominantly. And he said, okay, then only focus on those guys. Like, screw everybody else. Um, and I, I've never been combat deployed. I was in a non-deployable unit. But a lot of my peers were, you know, and for many years, like over a decade in different war zones. And just what they taught me about what goes on in their minds and the stuff they deal with, like their, their version of normal is insane. Um, from the stuff that they've seen, they've seen in, in the Middle East, you know, and, um, and it's just, I love those guys, man, for, for what they're willing to carry that they don't talk about, you know, and they don't get awards for that stuff. There's, it's invisible stuff, man. It's really tough to bring up. And so I just wanted them to not feel like freaks in their own skin, you know? Mm. Yeah, that's powerful, brother. So. And there's a lot so much that, uh, you know, our combat vets hold deep down that they don't share because they feel like they'll be looked at as freaks or some kind of ab abnorm abnormality if they share that with somebody who doesn't really understand. So really understand, like, wow. it's really cool to listen that you're hearing their stories and then you're putting it into words for the world to see. So then these guys can feel like they're almost sharing that inner dialogue. Is, is that kind of what it feels like to you? Yeah, and it felt really dirty doing that because I didn't go through those scenes, right? I didn't experience that. And I don't write too much stuff. I don't write too much detail about what they experienced. It's more of like some vignettes, like some some examples of what, what they went through. Because, I, you know, OPSEC and stuff, right? Some guys are still in the military. Some guys are still operators. Um, but the big thing was, you know, and I asked them multiple times. I was like, hey, dude, are you sure you want me to even even like brush this subject that you, you talked to me about? Because... A, it's super heavy and I don't want you to be pissed that I took your story and, and gave it to the world without your permission. But two, it's like, dude, you deserve the credit for going through this. Like you deserve some sort of honor, some sort of pat on the back, a hug, something, you know? And they were like, no, nah, man, like I, you know, I shared it with you. And if you want, if it helps other people, yeah, you can share it, just leave my name out of it or change my name or whatever. But they said, uh, you know, I don't want the attention for it. I don't want to have this conversation more than one time. I don't want to have to relive this every time we talk about it. Cause bro, they'd share stuff with me. And then for like three days, they'd have a hangover from it. Um, and if for anybody who's been through therapy, if you've revealed trauma to a therapist or whatever, like you feel gross for a few days, like you feel like you had the flu, um, just cause your body stored, it took so much energy to store that memory and store that stuff. And then you let it out over, you know, some scotch with a buddy or whatever the case was. And all of a sudden, you know, they're having flashbacks or having vivid nightmares. Everything that they re-experience is like fresh, you know? And then I feel like a jerk because, you know, I, I made my buddy go through this again, right? But that's why they're like, you know, I'm, I'm good having shared it with you. It gave me an opportunity to reflect on it and, and process it in a different way. Because um, I'd offer them a lot of like psychological terminology and stuff like that. Um, but uh, it took a toll on them. And... Uh, I just felt really weird about putting it in a book, not having been there with them, right? Almost like a version of survivor's guilt or like just shame from not having contributed. But they they were stoked. They were like, hey, thanks for listening. And I haven't really told anybody else this stuff, but if it helps another guy stay alive, you know, share it with them. Because that's the point, right? Keep, keeping other service members, you know, on this side of the grass, like walking around, breathing alive. That's... It's really basic, dude. Just keep our guys from killing themselves. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
I think that's special though, man. I know, I know it might feel like a little bit dirty to you or it doesn't feel like a genuine to you because you didn't experience it, but in all honesty, like giving them a voice and allowing that to be shared with the world allows other people to gain insight that they never would. And so it's, it's it's such a double edged sword for you. And I hear that and I see that. And on the same token, it's like, bro, it's, it's really amazing what you did by putting that information out and giving people that insight because most people can't understand that or will never understand it. But to, to be able to read it and at least get some kind of overview is, is really special, man. It's really cool. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks. It's, yeah, it's definitely for these guys, you know, and, and I mean, obviously like for any service member, they deserve a ton of respect for this and, and having friends who are like team guys, right. Um, even more so how much more like private are those guys. Right. And so, a lot of the lessons, a lot of things they've learned, they keep to themselves because they can't put it out there. They don't, you know, they just can't afford to have their anything public. And, um, but that means it's just more weight compounded on them, more stuff that gets to reverberate on the inside of their skull that they're not letting out. And that's, that's what bothers me the most. And so what's the balance on help these guys talk, help them share, um, for their, for their own health, you know? And at the same time, by the way, for like new officers coming in, new dudes in the military or gals, whoever it is joining, Like to understand the volume and the weight that your subordinates potentially could be carrying that you won't, you'll never know about, um, but it does affect them. And that's so important for leaders to understand, man, because just the way we talk to them, you know, the tone of voice, like I've seen it. I've seen an enlisted guy tell a a high ranking officer that he's going to put hands on him if he talks down to him again, because this dude's been to war. He's killed a lot of bad guys. And he's not going to sit there and let some guy who's never been to war come up to him, point a finger at him, and talk to him like he's an idiot. Like there's zero tolerance for that. And I, I almost saw him thrown out, and and I, I respected him for that because it's like, just as a as a human being, you know, dude, you got to show him dignity and respect, and that's where rank really doesn't matter. You don't know what this human being saw. You don't know what he had to do for our country. So if you're going to talk to him like he's stupid. Um, and you're the last straw sucks for you. Cause you're about to catch a, a royal beating, you know? And, um, I don't know, man, that, that's the kind of stuff that really impacted me. You know, that's the kind of stuff I observed yeah. as a leader is seeing that in the soldiers. 